With that, let's pray, and then we're going to go to God's Word together. Father, what a treasure we have in your written Word um, that tells us about who you are, your passionate love and pursuit of us, your children, your rebellious kids. And yet you've come for us in the person of Jesus, and we recognize the living word because of what you've told us in the written word. Thank you, Lord, that you've redeemed us, that you've made us your own. I pray, Lord, that we would feel that afresh this morning, that we would never take for granted the lengths that our God has gone through to redeem us from our sin and to pull us back into right relationship with himself. May we celebrate that this morning and delight in your word as we go through it. Help us by your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to take out your Bibles and open to Isaiah 58, this is the second to last week in this series. Pastor Adam's going to finish off the book um, next week. And I I didn't bother to count up. I think it's something like 14 weeks or so that we've been in it. But um, uh, we've tried to catch the main points that are there, but keep moving so we don't lose the forest for the trees. And then the series we'll do after this is going to be 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So you can uh, be preparing for that. Always great to just read those things through before we get there. So um, for those of you who like to prepare in advance, that's where we're headed. So we're in Isaiah 58, and we'll start it here at verse 1. Before we get reading, I want to ask you, have you ever gone to a church service, and then when you left, you left with the sense in your mind, what was that? That was ridiculous. That was crazy. That wasn't worshipful at all. Hopefully, if you've ever felt that way, it was at your last church and not at this one. But I wonder if you've ever felt that way. Like, boy, my heart certainly wasn't directed Godward. My affections for the Lord weren't stirred. I never felt any conviction for sin. Neither did I feel assurance of God's grace. I didn't feel equipped for discipleship, and I... I didn't feel sent to the lost world with the gospel. It just seems like we got together and went through the motions once again. Again, if you've ever felt that way, I hope it was at a different service and not one here. But I remember a service when I was a kid and I was in junior high and my dad walked out. He did the walkout. And here's kind of what set it up. Uh, there was a woman in our church, and she was singing a solo that Sunday, and, or what the church calls special music, right? That's our little label for it, special music. And let's just say it wasn't that special, not so special. Uh, and she was, she was a nice woman, but she kind of had, you know, she was a big hair gal. She had big hair and a lot of bling, a lot of flash, uh, and big smile, a little overwhelming, and then she was a soprano. And she was given a big song. And so she got into it in a big way. And it just came at us so hot, so shrill, so high that it was, you kind of just sat in a defensive posture for the whole song, hoping it would be over. It was not a blessing, not at all. And so we're all just kind of uh, stealing ourselves for this thing. And she finishes and we're applauding because she's done, not because we were necessarily blessed, but... Uh, it pretty well wrecked my dad for the rest of the worship service. So when the pastor got up to preach and he opened in prayer, that was the walkout moment for my dad. And he hit the trail, not heading to the altar, but heading outside. And um, according to him, he says he went out to the soccer field and sat on the bleachers and prayed for the rest of the service. And I say, I would like to see the transcripts of that prayer. I don't know, I wonder how worshipful it really was or how much prayer was actually being done. But, um, and this story kind of introduces really the first point of our passage here, which is this, not all rituals of worship are true worship. And so we'll pick up here in, in um, chapter 58 in verse one, and what we come to find out is that there is such a thing as true and false worship. Not just in what one believes, but in how one practices. And this morning we have one of these passages that starts off by punching you right in the mouth. So brace for impact, church. Shout it aloud. 
Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. And all God's people said, "Uh uh-oh, this might hurt a little. And so initially what we're confronted with almost seems like a paradox. Rituals of worship, wait a minute, they're not all really worshipful. And the prophet begins by basically exposing uh, what is happening in this setting where even aspects of worship are really an affront to God because of how they're being, uh, how they're being done. Look at verse 2. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. If this were a script for a play right there in parentheses, it would say massive eye roll here, right? as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you've not even noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? First of all, let's talk about fasting a little bit here and because in the modern church, contemporary church, we, we typically recognize fasting as a spiritual discipline where we abstain from eating to create a bodily discomfort, a hunger and an ache in our bellies to remind us and to drive us to prayer. And this is what we see. And this is a perfectly valid discipline to practice. Jesus, of course, did this when he was in the wilderness. He fasted for 40 days. And it's so easy just to say those words, but I ask you to think about it. That's like six weeks, like a month and a half, right, of no food. Most of you can't go 40 days without ice cream, right? I say you like I'm not in that group. Most of us, 40 days. But when we actually comb through much of the Old Testament instances of of fasting, uh, we find that it's often linked also with repentance. In other words, fasting is a way of creating a bodily discomfort in order to facilitate what ought to be a discomfort for sin. It was used to humble oneself and to promote a true repentance and a heartfelt confession, trying to approximate discomfort of hunger with the agony we ought to feel about our sin. It was a way of not just saying sorry, but really feeling sorrow for sin, and trying to create that ache within us. That's how fasting has been used really throughout the whole of scriptures, not just to facilitate prayer. Uh, But it seems that even this spiritual discipline of fasting um, by our crew here was being distorted. This ritual of worship had been turned into a false form of religion where it was being done for show just a gyration of just a spiritual exercise with no real substance to it. It seems to me that the reason it became a false religion was really three, three reasons. The first is it seems that it was trying to manipulate God, like a hunger strike or a quid pro quo kind of an exercise, right? We've fasted, God, and now you're going to do something for us. It seems to be manipulative, And then secondly, it also seems to be done selfishly. That is, in order to sort of keep their ritual of Sabbath and fasting, they had to take advantage of others to do that. Here's what it would sound like. Listen, you work the double shift. I got to go to church. You work the overtime. I know you want to be home, but I belong elsewhere. There's a disregard for one's fellow man, even in practicing the ritual here. And then thirdly, uh, they sought favor with God through this, uh, but all the while they're fighting with themselves. 
like arguing and bickering all the way to church and then walking through the doors and putting on the church face and beginning with, how great thou art, right? When all the way we've been living ridiculously, even on the way there. Some of you are elbowing each other right now. And so what we see here, these are just some examples of sort of false religion, spiritual practices that don't come from the heart and they're not reshaping the heart. They're just ticking the boxes of performance, going through the motions. And the question I'd like to ask you is, how do you spot false religion in yourself? False religion operates in a silo of selfishness where this is ultimately about me. It's all liturgy, but there's no love. It's all show, but never shows up in service. It's all profession, but there is no action. It is something that looks to the heavens, but in doing so looks right past their fellow man and the needs around them. False religion goes to church, but it never goes to the world. Let me ask you this question. Who is your neighbor? I don't mean in the big theoretical sense where Jesus tells the story of the Samaritan and that, I mean, like, who lives next door to you? In Alaska, this is a little different, you know. Sometimes your neighbors don't want you to know who they are. You know, they live on Don't You Dare Lane and, you know, Out of My Cold Dead Hands Avenue. These kinds of street names don't make you want to cross over and meet your neighbor. But who, who lives next to you? Do you know them? Do you, do you know their name? Do they know that you love them? Do you love them? Because if you're getting up and driving to church to say, God, I love you, and here I am to worship, and you have no connection to your neighbor, or no affection or care or love for them, you're going through a ritual and a show, and this passage is punching you in the face. As we continue on, we, we really find the heart of the prophet's message, which is this, real religion lives in loving engagement with the world. It doesn't isolate, it doesn't retreat, it doesn't withdraw, it doesn't shrink in. It lives engaged with a lost world. Verse six, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke, Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourself in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. True religion is a changed heart towards God and toward your fellow man. It cannot be just one or the other. True religion is plotted on both axes of loving God and and loving man. And this is really consistent with the view of justice that we keep talking about as we go through the book of Isaiah. I gave you the Hebrew word a couple weeks ago. It's mishpat. And it's more than just a fair transaction between two people. Mishpat, justice, big picture justice, is a world rightly oriented to God and from there rightly oriented to itself, to one another. And it's ultimately realized in the salvation that God is bringing to the world. That's the justice that's pictured here. That's how it's fulfilled. And the prophet sort of retains the phrase uh, fasting here, but it's really a placeholder, almost symbolic of lots of other kinds of ritualistic worship that could be done selfishly and could be done in disregard for those around us. And we, we see those really in, throughout the scriptures In Amos 5, he says, I hate all your shows, your religious festivals. I hate them. I want to plug my ears. 
You've got songs to sing, but you got no love for anybody. Away with the pretense. That's an Amos. We see the same kind of thing uh, for the Corinthians uh, in being callous about what they were eating or even in the way that they uh, participated in the Lord's Supper. They were confronted and, and the scripture says what you are practicing when you gather together for the Lord's Supper is not the Lord's Supper at all. This is an act of unity and pulling together and recognizing what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And you're doing it with callous disregard for your fellow man. And so there's all kinds of ways in which we can just go through rituals of liturgy and of worship, but are not loving our God because we're not loving our neighbor. Real religion lives in loving engagement with the world. When we worship selfishly, we are ultimately worshiping the self. So, and this is not a new teaching here. Uh, throughout the scriptures, we find both axes of loving God and loving man consistently tied together. When the Ten Commandments are first given, the first four are about love God. The next six are how we love others. So right in the giving of the law, we see this orientation. We see Jesus seizing upon this in the New Testament when he teaches all of the law and the prophets are summed up in this, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We see it in Jesus' teaching of the golden rule. Interestingly, this is, you know, in all of the a lot of classrooms, even in the public school across the nation, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and the, how profound that is is sometimes lost on us because it was written to sort of supersede what was known as the silver rule of the day. The silver rule said, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. It was kind of a do no harm, be safe, be careful, don't do anything bad to anybody else, just back away. But Jesus compels us to do to others what you would have them do to you. We're called into action, we're called into engagement, we're called to love, to do. Faithful Christianity lives in loving engagement with the world, the unbelieving, ugly world that's hostile to God. It lives in engagement with them. It loves others because that's the kind of God that we have. As the scriptures tell us, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait till we were in agreement. He didn't wait till we had conformed ourselves to his likeness or till we were pretty good. But in the midst of our hostility, his love motivated him to die for us. That is the pattern of Christians, to live in loving engagement with the lost world, not to retreat from it. As we look at sort of the situation presented here and how this fleshes itself out, if we're honest with ourselves and about the practice of our own discipleship and worship, then we will know that this means all of us are in trouble because none of us does this right or well or perfect. Right? I mean, I get dressed up for, churches, uh, for church on, on days where my heart is absolutely filled with sinful thoughts, but I put on my Sunday best to cover my inside worst. I've come in here and I've stood with you and I've sung songs of grace. And inside I have anger in my heart and I'm not trying to put it down, I'm even nursing it at times. I'm sure I'm the only one here that ever does that, right? I've given over my offering, and in the back of my mind, quietly, the thought to myself, aren't I a good guy? This is, this is the stuff that happens in our hearts because we're sinners through and through. We're really good at it, really good at sin. I'm a professional. How about the rest of you? Jeremiah says of us, the heart is deceitful above all things, and beyond cure, who can understand it? The Apostle Paul recognizes this at work in him too and he says in, in uh, 1 Timothy 1, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as, as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. What's the example? The immense patience this is what we are to have 
with the lost and broken world as we, following our saviors in his footsteps, live in loving engagement with them. So this grace that Paul speaks of in uh, here is not just a New Testament concept, but it's actually spoken of in Isaiah of all places. We think of the New Testament as grace and we think of Old Testament as judgment and law. Not so. I think it's amazing when we look at the passage here how crisp and clear the gospel is that God saves sinners. And this is 700 years before Christ appears on the scene, the means by which he would save us. So this is our third point. There is hope for sinners. God forgives the repentant. Look at chapter 59, starting at verse one. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Boy, that's good news, isn't it? We just stop right there and rejoice on that for a while. But we have to go further, and we're gonna come back to this. Verse two, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads a case with integrity. They rely on empty arguments. They utter lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die, and when one is broken, an adder is hatched. Their cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their deeds are evil deeds, and acts of violence are in their hands. Their feet rush into sin, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. They pursue evil schemes. Acts of violence mark their ways. The way of peace, they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks along them will know peace. And again, as we read this list here, which continues on for like another chapter or so, we know that if we're honest with ourselves, that this passage is a chalk outline of somebody who bears a striking resemblance to ourselves. We might say, oh, I don't have any blood on my hands. Think harder. This is our nature inside, left to ourself, left to our own devices. This is where we are in relationship with God. Our iniquities have separated us from God. But Isaiah began this indictment with those hopeful words, right? The arm of the Lord is not too short to save. And I say amen to that. Because the hope that is planted there is this. You are not too far gone. You are not too addicted. You are not too angry. You are not too big a liar. You are not too violent. You are not too greedy. You are not too stained with sin to be out of the reach of a saving God. His arm is not too short. I think of the nature of our God as we see him throughout the scripture. Our God is a pursuing God. Or as one writer called him, he is a missionary God. I like that phrase, a missionary God. The lengths he goes to, to redeem people to himself. And I just want to run through this. Here is the gospel story in the scriptures. Here is the missionary heart of God at work. God the Father sends prophets to warn his people of the errancy of their ways. He gives revelation so that his people might turn to him and know his life-giving ways. He rescues Israel from slavery in Egypt, from that bondage, and brings them into a land of their very own to be his own people. He rescues this same people again from Babylonian captivity after once again idolatry and sin takes them there. And in these rescues, he is all the time pointing to a greater and a fuller rescue that he will achieve in Jesus Christ. A rescue from bondage to sin, not just captives in a foreign land. The Father, through all of this, promises a servant Savior, one who will come to achieve this salvation and he faithfully sends him. And it could all have broken down right there, except that God the Son obeys the Father and agrees and he leaves the abode of heaven and he sets down his divine rights and he takes on human flesh and becomes a savior for his very own. 
He lives among sinners, eating and drinking with them, and they call him a friend of sinners. And I think that is a nickname I would really, really love to have. I would love it if people said, you know about Eric, that guy is a friend of sinners. It'd be the greatest compliment you could give me. And this friend of sinners became their savior when he died on the cross and exchanged his righteousness for their sin. And once, though we were spiritually dead, we were made alive by God the Spirit who regenerated us. We didn't resuscitate ourselves. The Spirit did this in us. And then he indwells believers, seals us in the family of God, and equips us for a life of faith, enabling us for obedience that we couldn't achieve on our own, which is obvious when we see the story of Israel. Our God is a missionary God, or as Spurgeon called him, the hound of heaven, who pursues and pursues and pursues that he might rescue. These sins laid out here, these are our sins, but the arm of our God is not too short to save. I think it's worth noting here too that there's two kinds of sinners in these two chapters that we've looked at. I don't know if you've noticed it. The first is the unrighteous in the chapter we've just looked at. But the second kind of sinner is just equally lost is the self-righteous. There are those who live like hell and do what they want. And there are others that try to look as good as possible so that they won't possibly need God. Both are lost. As we learned in our series through Galatians, we can be as lost in religion as we can be in rebellion. If we're trusting ourselves, we're lost. If we don't give a rip about God, we're lost. It is only in one's right relationship with Jesus that anyone is saved. Uh, Tim Keller, who is a pastor and author and theologian, and I hope somebody that you're reading regularly because he is a sage for our day and age and our culture. One of his big contributions in his lifetime and his ministry has been this, that the gospel is neither religion nor irreligion, but a third way of relating to God through grace. Through grace. Well, let's look at how this plays out here. Look up uh, in in, uh, verse 15 in the same chapter here. Part B, the second part. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. This is a tough passage because you read it and you're like, I don't really know how I'm supposed to feel about this. There's good in here. and There's some hard stuff in here. Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? And what we see here is the reality of the salvation of God that part of it is judging sin, purging the world of evil. And as you've heard me say many times, God is not good if he does not judge. He is no kind of God who leaves evil to persist in the world. None of us wants that. We just don't want his judgment to fall on us, right? And that's the good news. The good news is that it doesn't have to, that we can take refuge from God's coming wrath in God's given son. More than 700 years before the arrival of Christ, the prophet Isaiah speaks of a redeemer who will come to Zion, to those in Jacob, who is available to them if they repent of their sins. The gospel is in Isaiah. It's interesting, too, when we look at Jesus' public ministry, if you'll turn in your Bibles over to Luke chapter 4, Jesus is just coming to the front end of his public ministry. He's announcing himself, identifying himself. And he reads a passage from Isaiah. Luke 4, 16. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. 
And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus made it absolutely clear that this redeemer who was to come was he himself. That is his proclamation about who he is. That I am here. That I am here to redeem. And I want to ask you this. Do you know what the word redeem means? It means to regain possession of something or to to buy something back. Uh, Amy and I have had a great example of this lately. Um, A number of years ago, uh, some friends of ours here in the church had a particular vehicle that we envied. A good holy envy, not a bad one. Just say it like that. They had this great uh, uh, white 1997 Toyota Land Cruiser. And we're Land Cruiser geeks. You know this by now. And I always eyed this thing, and I had owned a couple before. And so I told our friend Carolyn, I said, you know, when you go to sell that, let me know, because I'm your buyer. And she'd always shake me off and say, oh, no, 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 we're not selling that. And I'd say, okay, well, if you change your mind. And this went on for a while, years. And uh, one day she told me, she said, Eric, I, there's no way I'm selling that thing to you while I'm living. When I die, then you can buy it. And I said, well, don't tell me that because then when you die, I'm going to have mixed feelings, you know. And uh, she thought that was funny. And uh, a little while later, um, I don't know if we wore them down or what, but they decided to sell. So we bought it and we had it for like 10 years and we loved it because we loved these old cars. And um, the only bad thing about it was it gets like 10 miles to the gallon downhill, you know. Uh, It's not not very uh, efficient that way. And we were driving kids all over the place, and it was like, man, we just can't keep running this thing. We're going to have to sell it. So we sold it. We sold a Land Cruiser. That's one of those things you just don't do. Don't ever sell a Land Cruiser. We sold it, and then we decided we're going to buy an exotic. So we bought a Subaru Outback, like the rest of you have, right? And Amy drove that for a while, and it gets great gas mileage. You know, it's a great Fairbanks car, and but she'd never felt as secure or as planted in the car. And and in her own words, she would say, it lacks inspiration, (laughs) okay? So we kind of got it in our minds, all right, let's let's get looking for a Land Cruiser again and see if we can find another one. So we sold the Subaru, and I found one. I found one last summer. Found it down uh, in Anchorage, had a blown head gasket, but it was a white 1997 Toyota Land Cruiser with almost the same miles. And, uh, And so... I bought it back. We redeemed it. And we repaired it so that we could get it running. And we drove it home. And Amy was so excited to have it back. She says this, I just want you to know. This is what she texts me. Just so you know, I'm fully committed to restoring this thing to its former glory. Uh, Interpretation is, get your wallet out, buddy. (laughs) We're going to throw some money at this. And so we're slowly restoring this thing, which is most of the time fun. And my friends, this is exactly what God has done in us. We were his originally. We rebelled. We were in a condition of disrepair. And yet he bought us back. And he is redeeming us and restoring us and building into us the life that he always wanted for us. And as we follow Jesus in our discipleship, God is actively giving us our lives back as we're refitted to be the way he intended for us at first. Discipleship is hard, but it's life-giving as we're restored to health and to wholeness and vitality, what God built into us being human at the beginning. This is what Jesus is doing. He is our redeemer, and he is reclaiming us for himself. The interesting thing is Jesus stopped midway in this passage of Isaiah, which basically announced that he was this redeemer. But he didn't continue. So I want to go back, go to Isaiah 61. And let's see where it goes from there. And this is going to take us right to our last point. Chapter 61, verse 2. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor 
and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Here we see our last point, which is this, that the forgiven are given a glimpse of what Christ came to do. He stopped where he did because that announced his mission on his first coming to be our redeemer. But as the passage continues, we see what he is going to do in his second coming as he restores us. And actually we're told in verse six that you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. So next week, Pastor Adam's gonna bring home the book and we're gonna develop this point a little bit. For the forgiven, God gives a glimpse of the things to come. In Isaiah, there is both judgment and And there is comfort, and this comfort is ultimately found in the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to turn our attention to the Lord's Supper. Father, we rejoice that your arm is not too short to save, because when we see the results of sin and the way we have separated ourselves from you, we realize that we are hopeless, helpless, except that you come and redeem us. Thank you, Father, for your great plan of salvation from the beginning to send your Son. Son, thank you that you have come in obedience to the Father and laid down your life. Spirit, thank you that you make us alive in Christ and seal us in the family of God and empower us for obedience. Father, may we not be those people who simply go through rituals of worship disengaged and unloving of the world around us, but may we imitate the very heart and work of our God. May we love our neighbor as herself. Lord, as we turn attention now to the Lord's Supper, I pray that you will plant deep in our hearts the work of grace that you have done for us in Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen. In just a moment, they'll come and pass out um, the elements.